Look down. What do you see? Your phone, your computer, TV screen, your desk, floor, a cup of coffee maybe. All those things have one thing in common. They can be controlled right now. Things you can manipulate with little planning, effort or thought. Now, look up. What do you see? The ceiling, trees, buildings, the sky, whatever is in the distance. They also have something in common. To reach them, you have to plan, think, calculate, and it requires more effort. Both of those worlds are managed by a handful of chemicals called neurotransmitters. When you turn your attention to the world of up, one chemical molecule in particular motivates you to pursue, to control, and to possess the world beyond your immediate grasp. It drives you to seek out those things far away, both physical and abstract, such as knowledge, love, and power. Whether it is reaching for the soul shaker across the table or flying to the moon in a spaceship, this chemical gives us the command to do so. It rewards you when you obey it and makes you suffer when you don't. It is the source of creativity and the driver of madness. It is the key to addictions and its recovery. It is the spark that drives scientists to find explanations and philosophers to find order, reason and meaning. It is fuel for the motor of our dreams and the source of despair when we fail. It is also why we are never happy for very long. It is why heaven is above and hell is below. This is dopamine and it narrates no less than the story of human behavior. Dopamine was discovered in 1957 by Kathleen Montagu and further research indicated that feelings of pleasure were associated with dopamine, which made some scientists christen dopamine the pleasure molecule. Research on drugs made it even more clear. The greater the activity of the dopamine reward pathway, the greater was the high of the subjects. Nonetheless, something was odd about those findings. It didn't seem likely that we needed yet another feeling good neurotransmitter besides serotonin and endorphins. In another experiment that replaced cocaine with food, expecting to see the same result, but what they found surprised everyone and introduced the beginning of the end of dopamine being the pleasure molecule. Dopamine, they discovered, isn't about pleasure at all. It delivers a feeling much more influential. The scientists Wolfram Schultz implanted tiny electrodes into the brain of macaque monkeys where dopamine cells clustered together and put them in an experimental apparatus with two boxes and two lights. One light was a signal that food was in the right box, while the other light signaled that food was in the left one. In the beginning, the dopamine cells in their brains fired when finding the food, but something interesting happened after a while. Dopamine release began to change, from now firing at the sight of the light instead of the food. Professor Robert Sapolsky from the Stanford University in California explains it this way. So what do we have here? We have first a signal, the light coming on saying it's one of those sessions. We're starting one of those. Then the monkey does the work and then with a delay it gets the reward. And what everyone initially thought was dopamine would go up after the reward. That's not when it goes up, it goes up when the signal comes on. What's this? This is the monkey there sitting and saying, I know this, I know the drill, I know this, I'm on top of this, this is going to be great, I know what I do now, this is completely perfect, 100% I'm going for today. Dopamine is not about pleasure, it's about the anticipation of pleasure. It's about the pursuit of happiness rather than happiness itself. If the Russian scientist Ivan Pavlov knew about dopamine back in 1897 and were able to measure it, he would see the same response in his dogs when ringing the infamous bell. From that, a new hypothesis arose. Dopamine activity is not really a marker of pleasure. It is a reaction to the unexpected, to possibility and anticipation. Everything novel elicits a high dopamine response, but when things become regular, their novelty fades and so does dopamine. Ever wondered why the person you once called 
love of her life became far less interesting after the honeymoon phase. Sometimes when we get the things that we want, it's not as pleasant as we expected. The excitement and anticipation of the future doesn't last forever, because eventually the future becomes the present. The thrilling mystery of tomorrow became the boring familiarities of the present, at which dopamine's job is done. You may enter. No. Yes. No. Yes. The dark side of dopamine got illustrated in this experiment. If you drop a pellet of food into a rat's cage, the animal will experience a dopamine surge. But if you keep doing that for an extended period of time, the rat learns when to expect food and dopamine stops because there is no surprise to it anymore. That's the reason why psychology discovered that intermittent reinforcement, or in other words, occasional and unpredictable rewards, are far superior in making an organism learn something and stay on its task than any other reinforcement plan. Not only rats are susceptible to this way of learning. Did you know that slot machines bring in a whopping 80% or more of casino gambling revenue? What's the trick here? Intermittent reinforcement. Sometimes you play for hours and get nothing. Sometimes you get lucky twice in a row. The anticipation that winning is just around the corner is what hooks so many people to those machines. Do you see any similarities with the usage of the internet today? Scrolling a feed on any app and occasionally stumbling upon an interesting post or a half-naked body of an interesting person and then again keeping mindlessly scrolling until the next sudden surprise awaits. It almost seems like those apps are designed to make you addicted. From dopamine's point of view, having things is uninteresting. It doesn't have a finish line. If you live under a bridge, dopamine makes you want a tent. If you live in an expensive mansion, it will make you want a castle on the moon. Dopamine can only say more. And often, this more is needed right now. It doesn't even matter if we are going to like it or if we even need it at the moment. Dopamine doesn't care. This explains why a person on a diet wants to eat a hamburger even though he isn't hungry and knows that it will ruin his diet. Or a drug addict wants his drugs even though he knows that it will ultimately make him unhappy or even kill him. Like a guarded missile, addictive drugs hit the desire circuit with an intense chemical blast and no natural behavior can match that. This blast overwhelms everything else and nothing else can compete. An addict will choose drugs over school and work, friendship, family, everything. The goal of the dopamine system is to predict the future and, when an unexpected reward occurs, to send a signal. Pay attention, it's time to learn something new about the world. This maybe was a cleverly designed system back in less modern times. But in our vastly different world right now, with all its super stimuli, dopamine gets secreted much more. Drugs artificially overstimulate the delicate system and it begins to connect drugs to everything future related. Want to celebrate? Use drugs. Feeling sad? Drugs. And those cravings will never stop as long as an addict keeps using drugs, even if the brain gradually loses its ability to deliver the high which is also called developing a tolerance to a substance. When an expected reward fails to materialize, the dopamine firing rate drops to zero, and that feels terrible. It's how a recovering drug addict feels every day as he struggles to get clean and sober. This takes an enormous amount of strength, determination and support. You better don't mess with dopamine, it hits back hard. How closely dopamine is related to motivation is illustrated in this research. Rats were put on a calorie restriction diet to increase their motivation to get food, which could later on be achieved by pressing levers. One group of rats had lower dopamine levels because of an injection of a neurotoxin into their brains that destroyed a certain amount of dopamine receptors. After pressing the levers, all the rats showed the same amount of liking of the food. But once the scientists increased the number of lever presses, a rat had to perform to get the reward, 
the low dopamine group showed half the amount of effort and way lower tenacity in their doing. They literally gave up earlier and the scientists concluded that the ability to put forth effort is dopaminergic in nature. They then set up a cage with two food options for the rats to choose from. Food that was again delicious for the rats and food that would elicit the same amount of liking that plain bread to a human would. To get the much tastier food, a rat had to press the lever four times. Minimal effort, but effort nonetheless. The rats with normal dopamine levels went straight for those treats. The dopamine depleted rats, on the other hand, headed over to the easy access plain bread option without even trying to press the lever. Ever noticed how some people buy the healthiest food and cook for themselves, while others take a bag of chips and ready to eat meals and rather sit in front of the TV? It's all linked to how much dopamine is available. Confucius once stated, Roads were made for journeys, not destinations. Daniel Lieberman, author of the great book The Molecule of More, gives us a solution to the dopamine trap that can catch all of us. So, if you want to do great things, fire up your dopamine circuits. Desire change, look to the future, motivate yourself. Cross bridges and succeed. But when you get there, you need to do something else. Something that for many of us is going to be just as difficult. You need to turn off your dopamine circuits. Let your here and now circuits have their way and celebrate your success. Connect with family and friends, and if only for a little while, remember to spend some time right here in the present moment. And on the bright side of things, there will always be another road to take. Look up.